Hi, my name is Mike Smith, and I'm with an engineering firm, firm called Smith and Anala Engineering Company, or SACO. Uh, we've been in business now for 10 years. We're a civil engineering consultancy. Civil engineering is a pretty broad field. Most of us uh, engineers, civil engineers, graduate with a Bachelor of Science in, in civil engineering. The direction that I chose to go is the geotechnical and construction quality assurance and, and quality uh, control area of our field, which involves a lot of construction. But the uh, one aspect of it that we are involved in is geotechnical engineering. And geotechnical engineering is uh, something that only a, a small percentage of civil engineers go into, but it deals with the understanding of the basically near surface soils and trying to identify the characteristics of those soils so that when the designer of a building, bridge, dam, whatever kind of infrastructure might be going there, they need to know what those soils are capable of, of bearing in, in terms of their, their loading that they anticipate that structure doing. So what our company does is we go out to the sites where the project is planned for and we advance borings into the soil. And what our attempt is to do there is to identify some of those characteristics of the soil. Some of those characteristics we can obtain just while we're out there doing the, the drilling activities and, and monitoring that. Uh, the depth of the drilling can be as shallow as five feet or as deep as a hundred feet or more. Just depends on <clears throat> how heavy the load is that's gonna be going onto that site and limitations of what the site itself are. Sometimes we wanna do a 20 or 40 foot boring, but we can only advance the boring to five or 10 feet because we encounter ground uh, uh, hard rock conditions underneath the, the soil. So what we do is we obtain these uh, samples and we obtain observations of the soil conditions. Um, and then we bring those samples back to our laboratory. Our company has a laboratory both in Tucson and Phoenix, Arizona. Um, just as a side note, there's about 15 other companies just in the Phoenix area that do geotechnical engineering, if, if not more. Then what we do in our laboratory, and, and we're gonna take you there and show you some of uh, those tests that we run, we do test uh, the soils that come out of the, uh, the borings that we take at the, the job sites where we're, we're looking at, and we do test on them. And mainly what we're interested in is what is gonna happen if uh, a given load is exerted on those soils so we can take the soil samples and uh, simulate those loading conditions in our laboratory and also evaluate the response to those soils um, so that again, we can recommend to the designer of the project what they can expect for those, those uh, structures and the loading conditions there. So that's one major aspect of our, of our business. And, and the other part is, so all these projects, they get designed and anywhere from a month to five years later, those projects will go into construction. Uh, a lot of times our geotechnical work is needed prior to the design being able to be completed. And at that time, the owner of the project may not even have the funding for the full construction. They may have just funding available to complete the geotechnical aspects of it and the design <clears throat> because that can take years. Some of the projects we're involved in um, one in particular right now, they're in about two years of a three-year design process. The contractor or general contractor, earthwork contractor, they need to have a pretty in-depth understanding of what the soil requirements are going into construction because not every site is the same. Not every site has the same recommendations for what we do to prepare the soils at a site to support the load that's gonna be going there. Sometimes it's pretty simple, you know, for a single family residential home, we may not have much earthwork preparation at all for a site like that. Um, other sites where you've got pretty heavy loads that are gonna be going there, as well as problematic soils on a site, and we'll get into that maybe a little bit later, there can be extensive working of those soils needed before the building can actually go onto the site. And I've always kind of described it like 
Some people think that the construction project consists of the concrete, the steel, the masonry, the things you can kind of see above the ground. But the preparation of the earth beneath the project is just as important to the performance of that structure as any of those, any of those uh, materials that I just discussed there. So a lot of times uh, what those entail for the preparation of the soils at the site, uh, sometimes the soils can be used as what we call engineered fill. So think of engineered fill as a pretty description of an engineered material that's designed to be underneath the structure to support the loads. So sometimes it's as simple as just removing the material or what we call an over excavation, uh, stockpiling that material, moisture conditioning it. Well, why do we moisture condition the soil? Well, the main reason that we do that is to achieve adequate compaction of soil, that soil needs to be near what we call optimum moisture content. And every soil has a slightly different optimum moisture content. It ranges from usually six, 7% up to as high as 20% or more. Well, if you were to just go out behind your house and um, obtain a soil sample there, you may have as little as two, three or 4% moisture. So a contractor needs to understand if those on-site soils are going to be utilized for engineered fill underneath the structure or backfill against a wall or uh, another part of the project, they need to know how much water is going to be needed to bring those soils up to that optimum moisture content. So if you have a site where you've got three or 4%, what we call in situ moisture, that's what we're starting with. And we're going to excavate those materials and we got to get them up to 15 or 20% moisture. That can take a, a lot of time compared to a, a soil, say, with an optimum moisture content of eight or 10%. So that's something that a contractor uh, needs to be able to identify during the estimating phase of the project or even the design of the project. Uh, sometimes we get to a condition where the on-site soils are of such poor quality that they can't even be used for the project. So what we get into in that case is where we actually have to import soil from another site and we'll take the existing material and have to just excavate it and potentially haul it off or what we try to do is we try to utilize those materials for other parts of the site where its poor qualities don't really come into play maybe that's just for landscaping or mounding or there's there's plenty of other uses and that kind of is a part of what we deal with is as a consultancy, you know, as a consulting engineer, we need to be able to identify ways to save money on a project. And depending on what your earthwork costs are, that can sometimes determine if a project is going to move forward or not. So having that understanding of what the soils are on the site, knowing what's going to be built there, and just, just having experience with providing these services and also having a, a another thing that's important is having a local knowledge of the soils on the site uh, uh, where we're working for instance most of the geotechnical engineers that I know in the Phoenix area have been here a long time if not for their whole career uh, and that helps because you've worked on sites all over the valley and a site we might be working on in in downtown Phoenix will have a lot different characteristics than, than something maybe out in some of the hillier or river areas of the, the valley. So it only comes with time and of course education, learning how to deal with those different soil properties that, uh, that we have out there. So once that design work is completed, the project goes into construction. Most of the geotechnical engineering firms in the Phoenix area also have a part of the company that does what I call quality assurance and or quality control testing. And what we're trying to do that at that point is all of the soils on these site, as a minimum, they're gonna have some level of moisture that's needed in the soil. And then they also have what we call a percent compaction. So oftentimes when we drive by a job site, we see a lot of equipment running on, on the ground. We see the spread of the soil taking place. We often see these water trucks and wonder, well, what, what are they doing out there? Well, what we're, we're trying to accomplish is we're usually placing that soil 
in pretty thin lifts, sometimes six, eight inches, sometimes even thinner than that, because the thicker a lift of soil, the, the harder it is to achieve density, the required density throughout that lift of soil. And what we're t talking about with the density is when we identify what a soil's optimum moisture content is, we also identify what that soil's maximum uh, dry density is. And the maximum dry density also varies across the, the valley, uh, across the state. Sometimes a maximum dry density can be as low as 95 or 100 pounds per cubic foot. With other materials, it can be as high as 120 to 125 pounds per cubic foot or more. So it's very important when we're doing testing on these sites to be able to identify what the actual maximum dry density and optimum moisture content of these soils are so that as the contractor is working on those soils and uh, placing them and compacting them, we can then document that the contractor was able to achieve that required density and, and moisture content. Um, one of the key things that we're, we're trying to identify in any geotechnical uh, project during the design phase is the amount of clay that's on a site. Um, clay soils represent problems for any kind of design on a project because clay has a property uh, to it where it is susceptible to volume change. What does that mean? Well, sometimes clay soils, if you add moisture to them, they can swell. Sometimes they can collapse. Well, we need to be able to identify those soils during the geotechnical phase of the project so that we can recommend to the design team how those soils can be dealt with during construction. Or, like I, I mentioned earlier, sometimes there's so much clay in the soils that they can't be used and they need to be taken off of the site, removed and uh, replaced with a more suitable soil or from a borrow source somewhere off site. So when we get into that construction phase, it often is useful for the contractor to have the geotechnical engineer that was involved in, his, in the design available to consult on that earthwork testing and those earthwork activities. Because sometimes a building doesn't go according to plan and the soils are no different than any other part of the construction project. We, we run into issues with soils. Uh, in fact, Underground construction is the number one source of construction litigation. And the reason for that is you basically don't really know what you have underground until you start excavating it. When we do a geotechnical investigation at a site, we try our, our best to advance as many borings uh, on the site as possible and use our judgment basically to fill in what might be between those borings. Uh, so just as an example, let's say we have a, a five acre site. Well, five acres is pretty large. We may only do three to five borings in those five acres, but we need to be able to make recommendations for the entire rest of the site. So during that design of the project, <clears throat> we may only have less than 1% of the site truly evaluated where we're gonna do these borings at the site obtain samples from those locations and do testing on them. But we should be able to identify what's gonna happen between those borings uh, and come up with recommendations that will allow that uh, building, bridge, roadway, whatever's gonna be going on top of that, those soils to be constructed and last for the design life of the project. 